you so much. Thank you so much for handing it over to the gyms. We we like to call ourselves Jim and I. We're a we're we're actually a band. No, we're not. We're just two distributed people working on distributed database and Kubernetes. Um, welcome everybody to the event. Uh, my name is Jim Walker. I'm actually Jim. Do you want to come on video so that we we make this a little bit more personal? Thanks, buddy. Good to see you as always. Um, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Jim Walker. I'm principal product evangelist at Cockroach Labs. Uh, my job at Cockroach Labs is to really kind of help people understand some of the technical underpinnings of, of what we're doing here um, and, and apply them to what they're working on. Um, and I, I love doing this. I've been in the Kubernetes space for really quite some time. I was at CoreOS. I've been uh, in fact, the first time I saw Cockroach TV was on stage with the CEO of CoreOS demonstrating something that's kind of very similar to what we're going to demonstrate here. So, um, Jim, do you want to just give a quick introduction of yourself as well? Sure. Yeah, my name is Jim Hatcher, and I'm a solutions engineer, which means I get to work with customers and prospective customers and help them work through, uh, you know, the, the technical aspects of CockroachDB and you know, help recognize if they're a fit for the use case they're, that they're choosing. And uh, so it's a really, really fun job. And I get to come on webinars occasionally with Jim Walker and uh, do demos of uh, Cockroach. So that's fun. Yep. So, and like I said, it's just Jim and I today. It's, that's our band name. Uh, you know, we're here to answer any and all questions. Um, as noted, please do dump questions in the QA. Um, I'm going to go through uh, a fair amount up front just to explain kind of what we're doing in Cockroach Database but I'm gonna to try to tie it to kind of distributed systems and the what I like to call is the distributed mindset. Um, I, I think in my conversations over the past couple of years, it's how do we help people become distributed? I, Cause I, I really do believe that this is the future of kind of all software engineering and, and all of our systems. Um, and I, I, you know, I saw the light a, a couple of years ago. And so I just like to expose some of the principles that we're using here. Um, I do like to think that Cockroach database is a, a PhD in distributed systems. I, some of the stuff that we're doing is, is pretty phenomenal. Um, we have lots of information in our documentation if you really want to get into deeper, deeper levels. Um, I know we, we have a SIGMOD paper that we published, oh gosh, I think mid last year, if you look up SIGMOD and Cockroach Labs, um, some really great engineering details there. Um, but you know, before I even start, I, I, I would be remiss without thinking, uh, you know, years and years of work on distributed systems and you know, a lot of the stuff that we do here at Cockroach Labs is descendant of a lot of the stuff that we've seen come out of Google over the past 15 years. If I think anybody who talks about these these concepts and doesn't think, you know, Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gemawat and, and, and many, you know, Eric Brewer, many of the, the distinguished engineers at Google, I, I think is, you know, it's, it's almost short sighted because this is this is the tech that's driving the future of what I feel is happening in the data center and the data center being cloud. Uh, and, and that's really kind of uh, the, the underpinnings of, of this conversation. So I hope this is valuable. Um, again, please do ask questions along the way. Jim and I love questions and, and we would love to basically, basically try to answer them in line as, as we're going along. So um, it'd be great. All right, so there's this concept of distributed SQL and, and this talk is about Kubernetes data and a distributed mindset. And, and the, 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 to me, the, the, the mix between this you know, what's happening in Kubernetes and what's a reality is that, you know, when, when I was at CoreOS a few, you know, a few years back, I always saw companies struggling trying to figure out, you know, stateful week workloads. I think at the beginning of the Kubernetes where it was all like stateless workloads, I'm like, well, what does that even mean? You know, the database is such a key component of all of our applications. Uh, well, let's say most of them that, you know, there needs to be kind of a, a re-architecture, a rethink of, of it as a layer of the software development stack. Uh, and, and that's really why, you know, there is kind of this emerging space around distributed SQL. You know, one of our, our partners in the CNCF, you know, like there's the Vitesse project, you'll hear, you know, how do they, how do you shard my SQL, you know, within a, within a single environment? How do you automate that? That sort of stuff. Like, is it distributed or not? And, and, and to me, asking the questions about distributed really comes down to really five questions. Number one, if you're going to be distributed SQL, is it SQL? Um, number two, I think a core concept in distributed sense is, is easing the complexity of scale uh, because it's kind of a big piece of what we're doing here in the cloud. Um, these things need to be geo-replicated, always on and resilient. Again, a core principle of distributed systems, you know, architecting for resilience into the system itself. 
let's not let you know technology around the thing uh, keep it alive. Let's let the thing keep it alive. Uh, and then if you're talking about talk SQL and you're talking relational, some sort of level of asset compliance uh, and distributed transactions and not single node transactions. We're talking like truly distributed kind of MapReduce style type, you know, distributed transactions. And then I think, you know, I, I, I often have this conversation, like I think the biggest concept to understand in distributed systems is we used to think logically, we need to start thinking physically. Uh, and and the, the nature of distributed systems, the whole very concept of the word distributed infers that these things happen in various different locations. And so from a data point of view, <clears throat> how do you tie data to a location so that you, know, you can survive failures or you can survive or you can, or you can uh, you know, provide low latency access to data anywhere on the planet. And that's something that actually we're doing in Cockroach. We, we, we think the database should deal with that. Um, but in your own applications and services, these are all things definitely that, that where data lives and, 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 and what's happening in your compute is a key concept to actually understand the distributed systems as well. So Cockroach was architected with a lot of the same principles as, as something distributed like, well, Kubernetes. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's inherent that it has scale, it has resilience. Um, it, it is multi, truly multi-master. Um, it's going to guarantee transactions. If you're familiar with something like etcd, I remember when etcd multi-master came out. Um, actually, etcd implements raft. We also implement raft. I'm going to get into raft a little bit here. Um, so there's kind of a, the, the core concepts of Kubernetes apply here with Cockroach. Like if you if you kill a pod, well, the control plane makes sure that the pod is up and running again, right? You, you basically set state for Kubernetes and it maintains that. We're going to actually show how you can kill a pod and the database is going to survive that. Um, naturally, uh, without loss of data, without loss of transactions, uh, and all these different things. Um, we build on top of a lot of the core principles or core concepts and, and classes in Kubernetes. Uh, you know, we can mount volumes locally with storage class, we can mount whatever PVs you want to actually go out and deal with. Um, and we build on top of stateful sets. And we naturally inherit a lot of the power of Kubernetes. Many people say, you know, oh, where's your operator? You have an operator. Well, funny thing is about Cockroach is you know, when I first got here, I argued with our engineering team to build an operator because, well, we kind of are naturally fit for Kubernetes. It's the day two operations. How do you do rolling upgrades? How do you do, you know, uh, certificate controls and whatnot? And that's the stuff that we're actually building into our operator. It's kind of the more advanced topics uh, that are going on. So my friend, Kelsey, uh, you know, he's friends of all of us and just, he's been fantastic for this community. He likens it, you know, Cockroach DB is the spanner, like Kubernetes is the Borg. And, and, and there's a lot to be said in that statement. You know, I think I'm tremendously for saying that, um, but I think once you see Cockroach and what it can do, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of similarities here. We are a descendant of the spanner white paper. So, so we're quickly, Cockroach is a cloud native database. Uh, this is relational database. So it implements familiar SQL. So if you, uh, we implement, we're wire compatible with, uh, with Postgres. So number one, we're gonna implement SQL. Um, but scaling a database like this is simply, uh, it, it's accomplished simply by, by spinning up a new node and pointing it at a cluster. Um, the database will redistribute data um, and, and deal with the incorporation of a new node. But what's interesting here is this is not just reads, um, this is for writes as well. Every node is, is a single consistent gateway to the entirety of the database. So. Often we think about scale in terms of volume. Um, we think about it as in terms of transactions, but we also think about scale um, from a geographic point of view. And how do we scale across regions and, and even clouds if, that, if, that's the, if that's the case? And so Cockroach is very naturally doing this. In fact, I'd say nearly every one of our implementations or a large majority of them are multi-region. Um, I know in our Cockroach Cloud product, I think, uh, I think 80% of our customers are actually deployed in multiple regions. There's lots of reasons you want to be in multiple regions, right? What if happens if an entire cluster goes out? Do I survive that? Or an entire region goes out? Do I survive that? For us, a region can be a cloud provider. It can be a region within a cloud. It can be an, a Kubernetes cluster. We, you know, I think my friend Keith McClellan and I did, uh, did, a, did a demo on a, on a previous Linux Foundation uh, uh, webinar where we talked about deploying a single logical database across multiple different Kubernetes clusters. 
you know, in the Kubernetes world, we often talk about how do we federate clusters so that we can have, you know, one kind of cluster that, that is in multiple different regions. That's really difficult to do. Why not just abstract that up to the, to the data layer? It's, it's often the way that we think about that, right? Because we can actually be multi-cloud. And we've done this before too. We, we're doing this now. Um, one single logical database with data that persists in three different cloud providers, um, which also is kind of a, this unique capability of Cockroach, you know, hybrid, multi-cloud, multi-cluster, if you will, right? Uh, and, and like I said, many people do this because they want to be able to survive the failure of, of whatever failure domain they want to think of. Is it a, is it a node? Is it a rack? Is it a, is it an AZ? Is it a region? Is it an entire data center? Is it, is it the Eastern seaboard for that matter? Or, you know, an entire part of the world and, 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 you know, cockroach is architected to survive those sort of things. It really comes down to implementation, implementation details um, of which, you know, my friend Jim deals with all the time, you know, helping people optimize their data at the row layer, uh, at the row level on, on how they want to survive a failure or how quickly they want data to get to a user. And there's trade-offs. Look at, we're never going to beat the speed of light, y'all. Like that's a, that is a physics problem. I would love to be here one day when we do. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime or not, but uh, you know, I, I think we're dealing with, 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 software now that is is pushing up against these physical limits and uh there's lots that you can do to get around and 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 to to optimize for those things but ultimately that's, that's actually pretty important a, a way that comes out if you think about a, a single database across you know three different clusters if i have some random using at user asking for i guess this is my ceo's uh, uh customer table here's Spencer Kimball's data, uh, and he's asking through, you know, uh, through a load balancer to any one of the nodes in the US West cluster, um, the database is smart enough to go find that data and the raft leader, and we'll talk about raft a bit from wherever that lives, wherever that resides, and then return that data. Now we do this because, well, you know, Spencer lives on the East Coast and he wants fast access to his data. Um, and so we're going to actually go and, and the RAF leader, the, the authoritative source for his records, um, is, is going to live on the East Coast. Because when we write data to Cockroach, we're actually writing it in Trivial Kit. That is uh, configurable. You can do five times. You can do it seven, nine, some odd number, because ultimately transactions are uh, completed via quorum writes. Two of three nodes have to actually commit. In this case, I can survive the failure of an entire region because I still have access to that data. Right. Typically, you'll put maybe one copy in each 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 region, so you can actually still commit and, and deal with rights. Right. And so, but it's an implementation detail um, and something that's configurable by you at each for at the row level on each table. So, say you want fast rights in every region. Well, you're going to have copies of that all over the place, and you're going to allow for rights to be you know follower reads and we have lots of features that, that get into these things and, and and it really comes down to what you want to accomplish with each table not a database in its in its entirety which i think is kind of one of those key things but you know being able to access data from any node is just it's just a key part of cockroach but we also understand you know you need security you need optimization we have a a distributed cost base optimizer when you do backup and restore in a distributed system is it distributed um, you know and and I you know I'd be remiss without mentioning our documentation again um, it's probably some of the best documentation I've seen in a piece of software in a long time open source or not um, and so I would just start there I think there's some, some really wonderful details there so okay so before Jim gets into the demo I just want to explain a couple of things on how we actually accomplish what we're doing um, it, and I think it's in these concepts that'll help people understand kind of what the challenges of our distributed systems are. Ultimately, Cockroach is a database on top of a database. Um, at the storage layer, and if you think about a database, a database has storage, right? because, well, we have to persist data. That's the whole point here, right? Um, you have a language, which, well, we believe that's SQL definitely for relational data. Um, I think that the elegance of the SQL model is, and the, the you know, SQL data modeling is just, it's apparent of how beautiful and, and easy that is to, to mirror business logic. I, document models are interesting. What happens when you get to, you know, 15 documents or 20 or what is that? What is the complexity? How do you change things? I, I, you know, the, the elegance of that data model is kind of interesting. But, but in the middle is this distributed execution, which is actually really, really important. Being true, truly distributed at that layer is also kind of one of those key things. But at the lowest layer, the storage layer, 
what we're doing is actually storing data using uh, a KV store. We actually had used something called RocksDB, which is an open source product. Uh, we actually translated that into Go and re-architected it a bit so that it is uh, uh, kind of you know, more optimized for some of the things that we were doing from a global point of view. So it could be a multi-tenant KV store, um, which is stuff that, that we're working on right now. Something called Pebble is what we call that. Rocks, Pebble, get it? So we, we, we do that. So in a, in a traditional database, what you have is say you have an inventory table, you just keep a pending record. So the end of that, you have an index that points to these records, just a bunch of pointers in memory. And that's how you kind of sort data, right? And that's how you store data, right? You just keep appending to the bottom of that table. Um, well, we had to actually rethink that. We redid that so that we can actually gain um, the value of KV yet still be distributed. And this gives us a lot of power. Um, so as I said, every table is a monolithic sorted KV map. Um, all tables have a primary key uh, and the K in the KV is the name of the table, the index, uh, a key and say a column name. And then the value is gonna be the column value. The, the best way to show this is just show you a, a table. Right. So here's a simple table. It's our dogs table. These are, you know, some office dogs that we have. And there's some entries over on the right hand side. We have ID, we have name and we have weight. Um, when we write these records to cockroach at the storage layer, what we're doing is we're taking, you know, this first record and we're saying, let's break it down. It's the dog table. There's the ID, there's the key. And then the, the, the column name is name. And we're going to store the value Carl. Dog 34, weight 10.1. Okay, so for the second record, for the third record, for the fourth record. Um, and, and what we're doing is if you just look at those keys, if, if you were just to sort those keys, like put them into say Excel or Sheets, whatever, right? And you sorted them, you, this would be in some monolithic kind of lexicographical key, like storage, right? Like it would be completely kind of um, sorted correctly. So we know exactly where to insert records. Now this allows us to do some really, really cool things. Let me show you kind of how we use that then. Um, in, in Cockroach, we have basically a concept of a, of a range, right? A range is basically, it's arbitrary. That It's not actually arbitrary. Um, what we do is we break down each table into these contiguous chunks. Think about this as a shard. We're using 512 megabits. It allows us to kind of amortize uh, indexing. It allows, it's small enough for us to move some things around. But if you just look at this table, we've, we've ordered everything and now we've created ranges and these ranges are now ordered, right? And so what we do is we, well, if you're gonna do this, you actually have to find these ranges in this distributed system. So we actually in, implement an index. If you're familiar with a B tree, it, it works very, very similar to that. Um, but what we do is we then, if we wanna insert a record say we're gonna insert Sunny into this table, we go through that index, we go look at that range and we say, hey, range, do you have enough space? Yes, the red range has space. Great, let's insert that record, let's move on, okay? Cool, great. Well, what happens in the case that I wanna insert another record, say I wanna insert Rudy. Oh, come on, slides, what are you doing to me today? Jim, you know, your demo is the thing that's supposed to have problems, not my like, you know, Google Slides, right? Uh, oh, oh man, I went too fast, there we go. So let's say I wanna insert Rudy into this range, well, the range is smart enough to say, hey, I don't have enough space. I'm hitting my 512 limit. Um, what it does is it splits the range and inserts the record. What we've done is just completely automated sharding. There's no like user interaction to do this. There's no like manual sharding in place. There's no like rethinking through the data. We're basically just doing this all under the covers in real time. Now we aren't gonna split a range in real time. We're going to let people, you know, go a little bit past the, the limit and then, you know, clean up things uh, in the background when a range isn't going to be used, right? So that we don't uh, affect performance of access or whatever that is, right? And so, um, but we're doing this all automatically. And if you think about a, a, a production database, there's hundreds and thousands of ranges of which, you know, a database like Cockroach will basically manage and maintain and understand kind of what's going on. This is just happening all the time throughout the entire system. Um, if ranges get too small, it'll contract things as well uh, in Cockroach um, to optimize, you know, efficiency for searching and that sort of thing. So there's lots of efficiencies that are going on, but ultimately, I think the key part here is is this kind of automation of really the sharding of the database itself. So this is that natural scale that we talked about in terms of kind of one of those core requirements. Now, 
we use something in Cockroach called Raft. And if you aren't familiar with Raft and, and you want to learn about distributed systems, I, I would highly suggest going out um, and, and reading about it. In fact, there's this really great website called The Secret Lives of Data. Um, if you, if you want to go check it out, there's a great, there's a really, really great um, description of Raft and how this works. You know, for our purpose, you know, this is how we kind of atomic writes and consistent reads across all of our data. Raft is implemented really as an odd number of replicas. So on the right-hand side, you see it's blue. This is that blue range. I forget which dogs. I, I'm pretty sure Buddy's in that range. So that's my dog, right? Um, but we have three copies of this data and that represents a Raft group. Now, this, the, the, the protocol is, is, is chatty. There's gossip going on. And there's a, kind of these coalesced heartbeats to make sure everybody kind of is in sync at all times. Now, there's a concept in Raft called a Raft leader. Um, a leader is elected across the three of them, and it coordinates all rights, it proposes commands to the others, and ultimately it, it's going to be able to serve an authoritative up-to-date um, uh, record for, for what you actually want to access. Um, it is a actually a key, key concept, and it is really what allows us to get this kind of atomic replication of commands. If I just ask the RAF leader to do this, and it can go on off work with all the other you know, the replicas and say, great, two of three have actually committed, the RAF leader knows this, I can say, hey, I've done this. And so this distributed consensus is such a key piece of distributed systems. If you look at Raft, uh, that's what we chose to implement. There's another one called Paxos, um, which is which is popular with, with, with some others as well. But to me, I think these are you know key, key concepts to actually understand in distributed systems. We use it uh, a lot within Cockroach and it's really kind of core of what we're doing here. Um, so then, Kind of what are, where are we putting this data in a cluster and how do we survive these sort of things before we get into this? Um, just kind of how it works. Basically what we do when we write data to a cluster, here's a four node cluster. When I write the first range, I'm gonna write the first range, I'm gonna write the blue range, I'm gonna write the red range. And we've basically distributed this data evenly um, from just a volume point of view across this cluster. Now, remember, this is millions and millions or hundreds of thousands of ranges that we're doing this for. We can also do things, we take heuristics on, on workload. So say there's a range that has you know, really heavy access to it. Um, how, how do we actually segment that off onto a particular node? Um, since this underneath the covers, the, your primary key is such a key piece of doing these sort of things. Um, you don't want to use things like sequential IDs in Cockroach, um, you know, because you're going to have you're going to end up having something called a hot range, right? You don't want all your access going to the very last range in order. You want to use some sort of random number, like a UUID, something like that. Like, there's a lot of best practices that come into play here when you set the database up, right? Um, but think about it from a distributed mindset as well. When you're dealing with a distributed database, do you want to insert 10,000 records in one command or do you want to do 10 inserts of 1,000 records, right? And so this kind of distributed thinking comes about uh, when you start to design the data and then how you interact with it as well, which is kind of a key thing, right? So you don't have these kind of overloaded uh, nodes for a particular transaction or whatnot. But we can also do something that's really interesting. And I, and I talked about this at the very beginning, you know, this, this concept of geopartitioning. You know, can we overload the key to sort the data in this in this KV store so that you know we can insert, say, a location to this? Because when we deploy Cockroach, we basically just say, hey, each node is assigned a, a region or a location, if you will. And if we can take that, that location and now tie it at the row level, say there's a country code for EU. Well, everything that has a country code of EU, EU is now part of that key, right? You know, the, the key for the first dog was 34. Well, what is EU 34? Now all of that is sorted. Now when my sort happens on KV, everything is in order of where things should live. And now I can say everything that has keys from, you know, EU, blah, 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 that's stored in Europe. I can use the database to tie data to a location so that really three reasons this happens. Number one, resilience. I want to make sure I have copies in three different regions based on what it is. Number two, speed of access. I want records that are in the EU to be located in the EU. Often we see people use this from a data compliance and privacy point of view. I want to actually just tie data uh, to say German users on German servers only, right? And so this is all configurable via some simple, very, very simple um, DDL within the database itself to actually take care of these things. So developer can actually configure this on the fly, right? We also rebalance things. So on a scale, okay, great. I add a new node. The database is smart enough to actually redistribute the data. So here I have just scaled 
for, for, for volume, but I've also scaled for transactions as well, right? Because any one of these can do this. And we can survive the, the loss of a node. If uh, I lose these ranges that are on node three, well, the raft leaders, which kind of have that dark thing around it, knows that one of the replicas is gone, right? Because I have to have a complete replica set of three replicas and it'll just make a new copy on another node. The database is just surviving this naturally. We can also survive kind of temporary failures, say the database, you know, you lose a node for say a minute or something, we can actually replay logs and, and get that thing back, right? So all of this is happening completely automated unbeknownst to you. Spin the cluster up, all this is, they're just there happening in the background um, and, and without any real configuration. I mean, the geolocation stuff for sure, but this stuff is all very, very natural. So, all right. So uh, I just wanted to give a quick kind of like high level understanding of, of some of the core concepts that are happening underneath the covers. Now, what, what Jim's gonna come and show is, you know, how is this aligned then with Kubernetes? Because if we can scale the loss of a node and Kubernetes can kind of ingest the loss of a pod, what if we're deployed on Kubernetes? How do we survive that sort of thing? How do we scale? How do we just put up a new pod, right? So Jim, I'm gonna leave it off to you. Um, I hope that was good, valuable um, baseline information for everybody, but let's go into the, the demo itself, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Other Jim. Other Jim. Hold on a second. How do I stop sharing now? I think Zoom actually, oh, there we go. Zoom hasn't changed. I've changed, Jim. Yeah. No, you're still the same wonderful person you always were. I'm Jim one, you're Jim two. That's right, Jim. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I stood up a, a cockroach cluster uh, in, in GCP. Um, and uh, I, I did it using. Uh, I just followed the some some documents that we have uh, on the cockroachlabs.com website. If you kind of navigate to our docs page and then look under deploy orchestrated Kubernetes single cluster deployment, I went through these steps. And um, once I had stood that up, um, this is uh, the the DB console we call this it's kind of administrative um, tool that you can use to monitor what's going on in in cockroach. And so you can see that we have we have three nodes here. They're called uh, cockroach DB0 and cockroach DB1 and cockroach DB2. And so this is actually running in Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Um, Jim mentioned that the cockroach runs very well in Kubernetes. We, you know, we kind of um, I would say we both embrace that distributed mindset <laughs> that, that Jim's talking about and kind of a cloud native approach to, to doing things. So I'll just show you real quick. We have, uh, uh, if, I, if I run a git pods command, I have I have the three um, cockroach nodes running, zero, one, and two. I also have a, another pod running, uh, which is my client that, that I just kind of use to run some commands. So, um, so let me let me uh, demonstrate a couple couple quick things. Um, one thing I'm gonna do is just run. Oh, I think we put that in the window. Um, I'm going to run a command here against my my client pod, and I'm going to run the cockroach command to run a workload called Mover. Mover is uh, like a ride sharing app that we use to kind of demo capabilities. So if I kick that off, and 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 Jim, just really quick, in the cockroach DB binary are several different workloads that you can just run. Um, part and parcel of the binary, you can run TPCC. There's YPSCV. There's the mover workload, which is a fake app that we created, but a lot of people would do this just to demonstrate or to just test things out. But but it isn't like you had to create that, Jim. It's just part of the binary itself, which I think is an important point there. Right, and um, I think that's um, with the, the Cockroach binary. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're we're, we're really um, we work well in, in Kubernetes is because uh, when, when you launch Cockroaches, you, you we literally download one single binary. Uh, and when, when you do that, that contains the code to run the, the engine, contains the, the, the code to run this monitoring interface and all the workload code and the client code. So um, it's, it's, it's a nice way to, to bundle things that works well in Kubernetes. So, um, so back over here, I, I, I clicked the metrics um, link over here on the left and, and on this main metric screen, uh, there, there are two, you know, kind of the two things we tend to look at when we're running loads is uh, this: how many how many statements are running right now. You can see that 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 ramped up a little bit when I kicked off that workload. 
So this kind of tells us our throughput. And then the other thing that we see here is our, our latency. So this is showing the, the, the 99th percentile of our SQL latency. So you can see it's about you know, seven, eight, eight milliseconds. So, so, so we, have a, we have a workload running. Now, what, what we can do over here in Kubernetes, um, I'll just remind us what pods we have. Um, I can kind of simulate if, if, a, if a pod went down or a node went down, um, I can just uh, delete a pod. I'll just delete uh, CockroachDB2. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see that gets deleted. If, if I come back over here to this DB console, a couple things happen. One, one is that we see that uh, we have three nodes, uh, but one, we, two of those are live and one of those has gone into a, a not good state. And then we have this other metric that we see called under-replicated ranges. Uh, Jim Walker mentioned earlier that by default, data in Cockroach is replicated three times. So when we get into an um, under-replicated state, what we're saying is uh, we're supposed to have three replicas and right now we have two replicas. So it, it's just kind of a warning. It's not like a, like a, a down condition but because we have two of the three, we're still able to, to read and write. And in fact, we can see that this workload is still running, still cranking away. Um, and then our, our, our metrics, you know, we're still seeing the throughput and we're still seeing latencies about the same. Um, now, uh, in the in the couple seconds it took me to to explain what was happening with the under replicated ranges, we can see that this node has come back, and that's because um, Kubernetes brought that node back. Um, um, you know, the, I, I have this set up in, in Kubernetes in a stateful set, so you know we 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 declare you know through, through kind of this declarative syntax that we want to we want a stateful set that's running three pods. Um, and so uh, even though I deleted this cockroach two pod, uh, Kubernetes saw that, that that wasn't there anymore and, and uh, Kubernetes brought it back. And because it's a stateful set, um, when, when it brings back a new pod, it, it connects it to the same uh, uh, persistent volume that was there before and that, and that hardware that it brings up in, in place uh, for compute um, you know, is connected to the, to the same data. And so we, we have, uh, you know, we, you know, Kubernetes kind of brings us brings things brings things back to a consistent state at the infrastructure level. So you know, I I, I think this this is a a cool illustration of how you know Cockroach kind of takes care of replication and high availability at the data level at the database level, and Kubernetes is watching things at the um, you know at the infrastructure level and making sure that we have the high availability there. Um, by the way, if if that had um, stayed in a in a dead state for for five minutes um cockroach will uh, um, kind of go into an auto healing mechanism where it says hey i've got these under replicated ranges you know i should have three three replicas but i've only got two and it'll wait wait five minutes for that node to come back up but if it doesn't come back up cockroach will say okay i'm gonna i'm gonna recreate that third range um, and put those on other nodes in the cluster so, so that's a cool cool feature so um, anyway, so we can see that our, our workload kept kept chugging during that time, and our, our latencies are uh, you know about the same. Um, so another thing I'll do here is uh, just kind of demonstrate how we can scale out the cluster. Um, you know, Jim Jim mentioned on some of the slides that you know we we can span we're you know, we're, di we're a distributed database and we can span um, multiple regions, multiple clouds. So. Um, you know, we, the, the fact that we, we we distribute horizontally is is a is a big deal. You know, it means we don't hit that scale ceiling where we can only scale up, 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 and then we kind of hit a certain size and we can't get any bigger. We can scale horizontally. So, to do that in uh, Kubernetes, what we can do is uh, we, we can give this command to say, let's scale our stateful set. Let's spell that out just so it's clear. Um, Cockroach DB, and then we can say the number of replicas we want is four. Um, so, you know, currently we have, we have three replicas, which are represented here. If I run this command, um, we can see that the stateful set says that it's scaled. And if I run this get pods command, we now have a cockroach DB3 that's in a container creating state. Um, and so if we, if we keep watching that, we'll see that this moves into a running state and goes into a ready state here. 
but let me watch the um, the dashboard. One of the things we should see here is that um, Cockroach will automatically see the, the presence of that new node, and we should see a fourth live node show up here, um, and a fourth node show up down here. Uh, let's see how we're doing. So we're, whoops, we're, we're in a running state. We're waiting to go into a ready state. Let me give that a second. Um, so one of the things we can we can look at to kind of monitor this is that um, the there there there's a met, there's a graph here we can look at that shows us the number of replicas per node, and we can see that uh, right now we have three three nodes and they're each got, have sixty six replicas per node, um, which which makes sense. And when we see this other node add, we should see um, node four uh, show up. Let's see what's going on with this pod. Okay, looks like when I started this, it hit, um, it failed our readiness probe. So let me, uh, see, I'll just delete that pod and get it to start again. Give another second. Um, so yeah, you're just basically restarting the pod. You killed it, and Kubernetes is restarting it, right? Right. Yeah. And I started this pod, and we there there are a couple of probes that happen in in Kubernetes. One is this um, the the ready readiness probe. Another one is a liveness probe. And so when when you get in um, when when you uh, you know, you have to pass the readiness probe, then you have to pass the live probe. So let's let's see if we can pass it this time. So I think you jinxed me earlier when you said, "Well, Jim, you know that's the way it's got to work." If my slides went awry, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, the, the point is basically you just you you have now just scaled and the database is going to automatically kind of redistribute data. It's going to take care of these things. Right. So, right. Oh, Jim, you know, you knew this had to happen today for us. Yeah, um, yeah it, it worked on my machine, it worked on my. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. But what I expect to see is you'd, you'd see another node show up here and then um, these replicas would balance, uh, you know, that we would see this fourth yeah. node. And uh, cockroach, cockroach say, hey, I can move some of these 60 ranges that are on existing nodes and, and push them over to this other node. So, so it's going to rebalance everything. And what you've done, you've not just scaled the volume of the database, you've scaled the transactional volume as well, um, which is such a key thing too. I think one of the things that Jim noted as well, this is a single binary. Any node in Cockroach can service a read or a write. Any node can take a transaction. The database is smart enough to actually understand what it is. I think another one, another kind of core concept of distributed systems is that basic ability. If you can avoid having two different types of, of nodes or two different types of binary, you know, I've seen other databases where they have transaction pods or they have storage pods. Um, it gets real complex on how you actually have to configure those things. Cockroach just takes care of all that through a single binary. The other thing that's really interesting is this this concept of having the, the the UI that Jim that Jim's talking about here, which we're connecting to what 34, 140, whatever that IP address, that's mm -hmm. just any one of the nodes. Any one of the nodes is going to service up this UI, um, and it and and that's kind of one of these other innate concepts within distributed systems. I think is really really important. You know, have a self-contained you know binary, which is that's the atomic unit of scale. Right. And, and it's, it's a kind of a complex topic, but I think one of these things is really important to understand distributed systems. If you if you could shrink your 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 unit of scale down to a single binary, do it. Um, avoid the complexity of having to configure on the back end and let let the system itself actually deal with that sort of thing. I think it was, those are one of those. That's definitely one of those big concepts in distributed systems. I definitely adhere to. And I think it's extremely important because um, it's going to reduce complexity. Right. Um, Jim, there was a question about, um, you know, different multiple environments, you know, like if I have, you know, prod, dev, stage, test, blah, blah, blah. Right. And so when we start to, you know, deal with these things, I think a lot of people are looking at, you know, moving data around between these different environments. How do, how do people typically accomplish that um, using Cockroach? And 
you know, avoiding storage costs in, in multiple different ways too, right? Like how, how are you seeing people deal with that? Yeah, I definitely see some folks that want to take like a, an image of prod and like move it back into like a UAT environment, like once a month or something, just to kind of have like, you know, production like data in another environment. So um, you, know, you can use like backup, backup and restore to do that. Mm -hmm. A good way to, to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah well, cool. I, and I think it's one of those things too, Jim, it's that, you know, like a, if you're doing backup restore in a single system, that's interesting. You know, mm -hmm. for us, backup and restore had to be distributed because if I'm just doing backup restore of a single database, well, yeah, I can create a new file and it's on a local like box or with some attached storage or whatever. But what if we are doing geo replication of data? Maybe we don't want to actually incur egress costs because, you know, we don't want all the data to flow from one region into another, right? Distributed backup or restore something that we actually had to implement. It's all the stuff that's around your system and has to be distributed as well. Uh, and these things are not easy to do, uh, but, but it allows you to do this sort of thing. When I think about different environments, um, it, it's really, you know, configurable on what you want to do. Typically, Michael, um, I think that's who's asking this. I, I'm having a hard time reading. I took my glasses off. Um, it is it is backup and restore. That's how people are actually doing with this. You know, shave it down. You know, do you have smaller um, production instances and whatnot? And then you know, manually dealing with that. So, um, I, I, so I also love this community, Jim, because of course somebody's trying to help us. You know, troubleshoot, which is like so perfect of you know CNCF and Linux Foundation, right? Like, hey, let's all help each other. Um, so I somebody was saying you can. You can restart Docker and the kubelet should fix the readiness probe, but I don't know if you, I don't know if you fixed it or not, but I just love that somebody had the, 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 the confidence in our demo that, yep, there was something wrong underneath. It wasn't us. It wasn't our software. It was something else, right? Like, yeah. So I haven't fixed it. I'm not quite brave enough to try to debug it all and get it working on the fly, but um, I, I will say that, um, yeah, I mean, we, I, um, we you know we have customers running this in GCP and, and EKS and other other Kubernetes based environments and um, you know yeah. it it it, um, it 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 works well unless you try to demo it <laughs> right no oh, come on Jim have you set up a cockroach on top of you know multiple Kubernetes clusters or I I've done that with Keith before what are, what are the complications there because I think that's a interesting concept for me for sure. Yeah, if you if you if you do run cockroach across multi regions, like in in the, you know your slides, Jim, you're talking about if you ran one in uh, you know Google, one in Amazon, and one in Azure or something, um, you, know, you you can stand up. Um, you, you know the way the way we do that is there's actually a separate Kubernetes cluster in each one of those environments, um, and then you make sure that there's um, you know network connectivity between those. So you'd set up like a um, you know v, v, VPC peering between those environments. Um, and then, you know, you have to uh, use like a, a CNI container network interface that, that, that knows how to talk between them. So, um, you know, the, the cockroach cluster actually, um, you know, does, doesn't, isn't really aware of the underlying infrastructure. It just knows, hey, there's these other, there's these other cockroach right. running in other places. So, um, you know, I think the Kubernetes uh, community as a whole, it hasn't, hasn't really solved this issue or there's isn't a, like a, a, a agreed upon way to solve this with like kind of federation of Kubernetes clusters. So yeah, the way we do that, that is we just have three separate clusters. And so you, you end up having like three, three separate control planes. So like, I guess one complication, if you want to call it that is that, you know, if you, if you wanted to scale from three nodes to four nodes in each one of those clusters, you know, you'd need to do it in each one of those control planes. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, it works well. I mean, I think that's a, that's an issue that over time we'll see, uh, an answer to where um, there, you know maybe we can do it in one one control plane across you know one like federated Kubernetes cluster, but um, yep. The... And I think there's a lot of movement there. I mean, if you look at what's going on in the cross plane community, if anybody's not familiar with that, like just having single control plane across multiple different clusters, that sort of stuff. I think the the work that team done has done is is phenomenal. Um, if you look at what Cilium has done to help kind of with the networking problem. Um, also very interesting, uh, a customer of ours called Form 3 is actually deploying us across multiple providers in production. Uh, oh gosh, I think Form 3 has, 
I think it's millions of transactions per day at this point. They're like a clearinghouse for, for financial transactions in England. Uh, and they need to uh, mitigate the risk of a cloud provider going away uh, at any moment. And so they're actually using us and they're using Cilium to, to solve that networking problem. Because I think that's the big problem, right, Jim? I think the, the networking is the piece that when you start to go across clusters, or you go across clouds, uh, that's, the, that's the big complexity, I think, so. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the nice thing about Kubernetes is, is it's a consistent interface so that, you know, the, you know, the fact, it's not like you, the, everybody's kind of running their own, you know, wildly different version of Kubernetes. It's, it's just, uh, you know, making sure that, that, that everything, everything's talking to each other in a, in a consistent way. That's right. Well, and the other part about the Kubernetes community is projects pop up to solve problems, right? Um, you know, we were using open tracing to do some sort of, you know, to, to root cause issues and performance of cross queries. We're now implementing open telemetry. If you're not familiar with the open telemetry project, another one, super, super interesting. And I think the second most popular project in the CNCF now. So, um, but we're using all those things. And I think it's just part and parcel of the, the overall community. So um, Jim, I'm going to round this off with, with one last kind of part of this talk. If there are any other questions, please, y'all do dump them into the QA. Jim, just interrupt me if there's something that's interesting comes through. I'm going to kind of have one screen today. So, um, so, so just real quickly, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, just, just visually, this is the way things used to work. When I used to code, I had an app server, I had a database. Often this was just Fox Pro running on my laptop. Uh, I'm joking. It was just a database somewhere. There was a server, there was my app. Um, the, the problem with these, these things is these round trip times. Um, if you think about somebody in New York accessing the database, let's say on a cloud in South Carolina or wherever that is in US East, well, the, the, the speed of light is no joke. Um, you know, if we're talking about a 70 millisecond round trip time between the West Coast and back, um, you know, if, if from a human point of view, what, what's, what's real, like discernible as real time is somewhere around 100 milliseconds. This concept of the 100 millisecond rule, which actually the, the Google team thought of as they were doing Gmail. But what happens if I have a transaction that takes multiple trips back and forth, right? Consumers don't have the patience. And, and further, you know, you have timeouts, you have a bunch of different issues that can go wrong here. Um, also, the way that we backed up our systems, well, we had to actually use this kind of asynchronous replication. So you have these kind of like active passive systems. What we're talking about with a distributed database is just active active. Everything's active all the time. Everything can serve as a query. I could lose a node and it's, and it's completely fine. If, if you lose your primary and you have to back up to a secondary, what's your RPO and RTO in those situations? How do you remediate when, you know, the secondary, when the primary is ready to come back online and you have a bunch of transactions that happen in the secondary? What if it's hundreds of thousands of transactions in that five minutes or, or in that hour or whatever that is? How do you remediate these two? Like, what, what is the right state of your data? There's lots of issues. This has worked for a long time for all of us. You know, we propose just a concept of active active, have multiple different nodes. I mean, this is just a, a better way of thinking about not just latency, but also survivability. Um, because if I have users say on the East Coast and the West Coast say have Phoenix is accessing US West, it's say it's seven milliseconds back and forth to LA uh, and it's 24 milliseconds for rights, right? It's seven milliseconds round trip time. Um, well, what happens if US West goes down and I'm just simply going up to the US West and I have copies of that data there. I've basically, I have the quality in my latency. It's actually the same amount of time. I didn't even have to hop through that thing, right? Because before I was hopping seven milliseconds to LA and then another 24 to get up the coast, right? That was, what is that? Do my math is 31, right? Well, what if that just went away and it was just a simple 31 milliseconds from, you know, say Phoenix to there. I have now the same thing. I've completely survived the failure. There's lots of different ways to configure a database to actually deal with these things. And so finally, um, as Jim was talking about um, and I talked about, don't federate clusters, distribute the data. I, I find this to be a, a very interesting approach to kind of the multi-cluster thing. You know, maybe you still have to manage two clusters, but you don't have to manage it from a data point of view. And the application layer can actually just deal with it as it's a single cluster, um, because this is a single logical database that's spanning multiple different Kubernetes clusters, right? I think that's a kind of one of these unique capabilities of CockroachDB. Um, we have a Kubernetes operator, as I as I said, um, it's kind of handling a lot of the day two operations. We're continuously working on this. Um, you know, and if we have continuously releasing things, um, you know, to help you kind of deploy, 
um, manage, uh, do rolling upgrades. Uh, the same way you do rolling upgrades across pods, well, you can imagine in Cockroach, spin down a node, spin a node back up with a new version. Uh, I think we're backwards compatible to, Jim, is it two major versions or three? I think it's two major versions, right? Two, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that'll be a whole year or so. And then survive pod failure. So, um, you know, we're, we, we've been at this for a while. Um, you know, we feel we do have kind of this kind of cloud native database uh, that is kind of purpose built for Kubernetes. If anybody's interested in learning more, our documentation is amazing. There's also Cockroach University. We are building lots of courses, uh, adding new courses regularly. If you want to learn about Cockroach, I think we have some basically general purpose SQL stuff, um, distributed systems. Um, but, a, but a great resource, um, but our docs is really great. And if you want to get started today, you want to try this out, um, you know, Cockroach DB uh, in the cloud uh, is just a service you can get up and running in minutes. Um, there's also, uh, we have a serverless version of this, which will completely automate scale. Uh, we believe will change kind of the face of database and what this, what this completely is, because we don't have to deal with any of this kind of backend configuration. But, you know, this is us running Cockroach DB on Kubernetes. Uh, our, our Cockroach Cloud is actually all Kubernetes underneath. So we've learned a lot about this stuff over the past couple of years and, um, you know, we're ready to share this with, with anybody. Um, so, okay. Well, that's, I think, all I had. Jim, anything else before we take off? I don't think there was anything else in the QA, was there? Uh, I don't think so. There's one other question, but I answered that um, about okay. how Kubernetes keeps up with IP addresses. And... Okay. Oh, cool. Um, everybody, thank you for joining. I, I hope this was valuable. Um, you know, on behalf of Jim and I, you know, we, we love talking about this stuff. I, I hope it comes out in, in the way that we speak about it. Um, you know, Jim and I uh, are happy to answer any questions that anybody has. I'm, I'm Jim at Cockroach Labs. And Jim, what are you? I'm Jim one. So I'm just Jim at Cockroach. What did you end up being with an, with an email address? Jim H? I am Hatcher, my last name. Hatcher. Yeah, and see. We're, we're the gyms though. So yeah. um, engage us in our Slack channel, reach out, download it, use it, go check out our docs. I think this is the best way, but um, you know, lots of information of how to do this on Kubernetes. You know, we just do feel this is a, the right database for, for that environment. So um, thank you everybody for joining and back to the Linux Foundation to wrap things up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim and Jim for your time today. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, as a, just a quick reminder, this recording will be available on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. Okay, we hope you will join us for future webinars. Thank you so much again and have a wonderful day.